Welcome to Complexity Made Simple. My name is Paul Allen and before we get into today's video well I'm just going to remind you the three books that are on sale drink tea and read the paper if you're a green belt and a black belt and you want simple instruction on how to apply your skill design of experiments for 21st century engineers and finally a statistical process control for small batch production. They are all available from lulu.com and the links are in the video below. Welcome to Complexity Made Simple. My name is Paul Allen and the subject of today's video, well we're going to talk about Six Sigma, we're going to talk about world-class engineering as I like to call it, world-class engineering in your design function because people keep talking about what what's after Six Sigma what comes after Six Sigma I don't understand this question what comes after world-class engineering well you just make sure that you keep doing world-class engineering so we are going to talk about world-class engineering in design so you might call this design for Six Sigma if you really wanted to but because people don't understand what Six Sigma is people don't understand what a black belt is capable of they don't understand what black belt training is about it's about creating a world-class engineer we're gonna call it world-class engineering so let's use a little example it's very simple um, I'm obviously making up some of these um, uh, some of these comparisons some of these examples simply to show you how powerful Six Sigma could be in a design situation so we are going to imagine that we are designing an electric motor now in this day and age there's all sorts of new opportunities for designing electric motors and electric cars and uh, being super efficient in vacuum cleaners and all sorts of things so suddenly the, the good old bog standard electric motor suddenly we're trying to make it do more we're trying to make it be more efficient probably make it cost less way less all sorts of things so we're going to look at the idea of a very simple uh, electric motor so here we've got the um, we've kind of got the gobbins we have, we're going to have some obviously some some copper windings here so this is the internals this is the internals of a badly drawn there's going to be some copper windings going around these these cores here yeah so we're trying to design an electric motor and of course we're trying to get certain things out of it we're trying to get it to be most powerful we're probably trying to control the cost we're probably trying to control the uh, the energy consumption there may be something else and of course sometimes the designer will say well I can get the power but I can't get the cost I can get the cost but I can't get the energy consumption and he's trying to hit this sweet spot and of course he's playing around with his design and he's trying to find the place that keeps everybody happy well what we're going to take a look at world-class engineering how would a black belt deal with this okay so so here we have the electric motor and we're going to say that we've sat down with the experts and the experts have told us well look there are five parameters in this electric motor that we tend to move around to move the power the cost the energy consumption etc and those five parameters are so this is the this is the motor design and I have no idea by the way I've made these parameters up I have no idea whether these parameters make any difference to the efficiency in an electric motor but I'm just making this up as an example of what a world-class engineer would do to get new knowledge about his system okay so we've sat down with the experts and they've said this to us look okay look the number of coils 
Yeah, so the designer can put a number of these coils around the, the rotor and the stator. Um, how many coils do we actually have? Okay, so the number of coils, uh, and I think they've gone um, four to six. I'm not even sure whether that's possible, but anyway, they, and this is the design space, really important. This is the design space that the designer is saying he's going to work in. Um, then what we've got is for each of the coils, we've got the number of turns. Okay, and again, the experts have told us that their design space is between 40 and 60. So that's where they might move the design around. Um, then what we've got is the wire thickness. So obviously we've got copper wire here. So we've now got the wire thickness. And uh, I think we're going one millimeters to 1.2 mil. That's our design space. Then they're gonna get clever and they're gonna put some silver alloy in the copper that's in the windings because silver tends to make electricity flow a little bit more so we're going to put some we're going to put some silver percentage there's a little alloy no idea whether you can alloy silver with copper but uh, anyway so we're going to go uh, let's have a think uh, one percent up to two percent and obviously that's an expensive thing to do. Putting silver in there is an expensive thing to do. Ma making it as an alloy instead of just taking uh, pure copper. Um, that's gonna be an expensive thing to do on a number of levels. And then finally, we're gonna look at the, the iron core that the, the copper is wound around. And we're gonna look at the density of the iron so these things are sintered let's put that in properly so the core density um, these things are sintered what have I gone for 4.4 to 6 let's have a look so the core density 4.4 to 6 okay so if you look at this if you look at this design space um, you know, the number of combinations, I'm not quite sure what the number of combinations is here, but we've got three times 20, which is 60, times 12, um, which is 600, 720, 720, plus another 10 here, 720, 7,200, uh, plus another 16. So whatever 7,200 is, times 16 well it's at least 72,000 plus oh, another 40 odd so it's about we're talking about a hundred approximately I haven't worked it out properly but this designer look has literally got he's literally got a hundred and ten thousand ways hundred and ten thousand choices as where we could put the, the design inside that design space okay and he's got to find he's got to find a sweet spot so the things that he's interested in measuring coming out of here power okay what else cost energy consumption I'll add something else. Let's say talk. Okay, so we got five inputs, we got four outputs. And now the designer has got to try and optimize this. He's got to try and find the design. Now think about this. He's got 110,000 choices for this system, for this system, for this system, for this system. So there's 500,000 choices approximately. And in amongst those 500,000, there is a sweet spot, potentially, where he might hit all four of the targets that someone is setting. Now, it could be that there isn't a sweet spot, by the way. So he could be searching in a space for something that doesn't exist. How about that? And that's where most of the waste is gonna come from. He's searching for a solution here for something that doesn't exist. Now, let me show you.
a world-class engineer. Now, what knowledge have we needed up to now? Well, the experts have told us the design space. They've told us the elements that are important. But now, world-class engineering takes over because we're not gonna expect the expert to be able to guess the solution. What we're going to do is we're gonna give this problem, world-class engineering, to a designed experiment. Now, this is exactly the way you should do it. World-class companies, the designers, would do designed experiments, DOEs, day after day after day, probably two or three of these a day. I don't know how you'd answer this problem any other way. And by the way, your computer can't do this. We are gonna do some things here where we're gonna choose tolerances, we're gonna choose uh, spots in the design where the tolerance can be at the widest. Your computers can never do what we're about to do with a designed experiment. So let's go to the computer, let's look at the pattern, and let's look what a designed experiment would tell you. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do, I'm gonna to go to my DOE software, and I'm gonna go create design. And I'm gonna create an experiment that will allow me to understand the design space that we've just described. So five factors, five inputs were what we identified. So if I click next, and I click through this menu, it's gonna ask me what the five are. So at this point, I would type in things like uh, the, the number, of coils and I would put in there four and six then I'd put the number of turns and I'd put 40 and 60 etc I'm not going to go through all that just to save some time but if I click next it says how many responses do you have well we had four didn't we so if I put four in there what it's going to ask me for is four pieces of data and look I've got a window here where I can actually say what the response is. So power, cost, energy, and torque would all be typed in there. Now I'm gonna cancel that out because I've already done this. There is the pattern that the experiment wants you to do. Now this is the most efficient pattern. Let me talk about where the pattern is before we look any further at this. Okay, so this pattern, where is it? Well, it's very simple, look. A designed experiment is going to test the design space. And it tests at the extreme of the design space. So this is the design space that your designers have just created by naming those five variables. Now, I can only draw three of the dimensions because I can't draw a five-dimensional box. But in mathematics, five-dimensional boxes do exist. So if we put the number of coils here, look. So if we go coils, and we say, what do we say, four to six. Then we went number of turns. So the turns here, and we go, what is it, 40, 60. And then finally, back to front, we'll go wire thickness. Okay, so wire thickness. And the wire thickness is one millimeter at the thin, 1.2 millimeters at the thick. Now then, what's the designed experiment going to do? Well, it's gonna do this, look. It's gonna ask you to test at the corners. All right, it's going to ask you to test at the corners. Then we fill the box with mathematics and then we can ask it to hit a sweet spot if a sweet spot exists. Now by the way, there'd be four of these boxes, one for power, one for cost, one for energy, one for torque. And then the, what you'd ask the computer to do is hit the target, hit four targets at the same time. And if it can do it, it will tell you that it can do it 
and it will give you the parameters in order to do that. It'll tell you what the design should be. Now that's what a designed experiment is. It's testing at the corners. Now it's a little bit more complicated here because this is five variables. So essentially there are 32 corners to test. Um, but I can't draw that, but that's what this experiment is doing. So let's go back to the pattern and look what it's asking for next. Okay, so if you look at the pattern now, what I've got, look, is four empty sheets. So the first sheet is for the power, the second sheet is for cost, etc. And of course they're empty because what you're going to do, now this could well be on a computer, so you're not designing 28 motors and putting 28 motors on test. What you're doing is you're working on your computer your finite element analysis is doing this work and then what you would do is you would set the thing up and you would ask for a result out of your finite element analysis and of course what you've got to do then populate the table of the results whatever they whatever they come out to so I've no idea what these things might be yeah, so you're going to put all the, the, the data in for the power. You're going to put all the data in for the cost. Now, obviously, if you're doing this on a computer, this is literally this is literally five minutes work. That's why I'm saying your, your designer should be doing three or four DOEs a day because this is the fastest way to find out how a system works. So imagine now that we've populated all that data for those... Um, for those four outputs. So we have four pages of data. Now what we want to do is we want to do some analysis. So if I go to analyze design, the first thing I'm gonna do is some simple, I'm gonna do some simple graphs. So I'm gonna do one for power. I'm gonna do one for cost. I'm going to do one for energy consumption. And I'm going to do one for talk. Now, by the way, just something to point out. This table is actually full of random numbers. So the analysis you're seeing is just complete look of the draw from the random data that's gone into my table. But you can see now from the graphs, let's take a look. So if this was real data, what would it be telling me? Well, this is, this is the, the torque, and it's saying, look, the number of turns is driving the torque very powerfully. So is the number of coils, so is the thickness of the wire. The silver and the core density has very little effect. Then we look at the energy consumption. So again, look, turns and thickness are driving this thing. Core density is now part of the, part of the system. Now I'm looking at, let's look at this one, this is cost. So cost, silver happens to be driving the cost, and that's probably true of, of if it was happening in real life. And then finally, what's driving the power? Well, the silver and the number of turns is very powerful, and the thickness of the cable is very powerful. Now, how would you get this knowledge so clearly and so obvious through any other technique? Now what we're going to do is we're going to go back and I'm going to create equations now for each one of those systems. So I've asked for a regression equation. Now what am I going to get? Well now I get a regression table and here it comes. Now on this page, now what we have here is a model, model for cost, model for energy, model for torque. I've now got a mathematical model so that I can see what's going on. Now let's do a quick analysis just to show you the power of the information that comes out of this uh, DOE analysis. There's no other technique can no other technique can work as well as this. So I'm going to draw a picture of one of the interactions. I'm going to draw the CD interaction over here. So two of the variables interfere with one another. They interact. So I'm going to draw the interaction. So CD, let's have a look. It's going to be thickness versus 
silver so it's the wire and you would expect these two to interact because it's the thickness of the wire and the percentage of silver in the wire you would expect those two variables to interfere with one another so if I create an exit and I let the graph get created now that that plane there that twisted plane that saddleback that's showing you how this system behaves to thickness and silver content now it's just showing me how the power performs at this point but if I go to a slightly different diagram now this diagram by the way is just going to show you the edges so it's going to show you the back edge the front edge and it's going to show you one line in the middle of that plane so that's what the interaction plot is so this is a much simpler diagram now back edge front edge and a, a section right through the middle okay now then how would I use the interaction plot? Well, of course, there's a couple of things I want to do. I want to be high. So the, the highest line, that light blue line, that's where I want to be, because I want to get power at the absolute highest. But look what happens if I go to the top. There's a great thing happens. If I go to the very top of that saddleback, the very point where it reaches the highest, I can also set a very wide tolerance. So let's go back to the whiteboard and we'll have a little look at this and I can, I can draw a diagram, it might be easier to explain. Let's go back to the whiteboard. Okay, let me just sketch that interaction line for you a second because what it looks like is this. You've got a line that's going up and then topping out here and of course here we're interested in this happens to be power okay so let me just show you the knowledge that's coming out of a designed experiment and your computers can't do this your finite element analysis can't do this your computational fluid dynamics they can't do this they're not smart enough to know the context here so this is knowledge that your skilled engineers and world-class engineering can only get together so if you get this diagram what's he telling me well of course I want to be at the tip here of this particular diagram so this would be telling me and I'm trying to remember what the thickness was the okay so this was thickness here this is the thickness of the copper wire so it's now telling me where to be on the thickness of the copper wire now if I have a target so if we're here there's a target and we're going to make a promise we're going to make a promise to the customer and we're going to say well look Mr Customer we're going to hit this target and we will always make sure that the power is between this tolerance now look if I take this tolerance across look now look at this there is your tolerance it is telling me the tolerance to put on the thickness of the copper wire and because I'm at the top I'm at the peak of the curve the tolerance is at its widest I mean look how wide I've made that tolerance if I'd have made that spec that I'm promising the customer if I'd have put it there look how tight my tolerance would have had to be but look how wide my tolerance can be now look at that now, if you can draw these pictures, if you can draw these pictures with world-class engineering, you can smash the competition absolutely out of the water. Because what are you doing? You're providing the best performance with the cheapest manufacturing system. Because all your tolerances are really wide, your defect rates will be really small, your processes will just work sweet as a nut. Now, this is world-class engineering. This is design of experiments working in a design situation. Only world-class engineering can do this. Only design of experiments can do this. Any other technique is rubbish compared to this. Now here's the question. How many world-class black belts have you got working in your design department using world-class engineering every single day? because that's what a black belt brings to your company that's what Six Sigma is so if you ever ask the question 
Where do I go next with Six Sigma? What comes after Six Sigma? I don't understand this. This is world-class engineering. It is sucking knowledge out of your designs and making you make more money. The next thing to do with world-class engineering, the next thing to do with Six Sigma is to make more money.